welcome back to the History Machine podcast. This is episode 15, The First Emperor of China. Now, if you haven't listened to episode 13 and episodes 14, we would thoroughly recommend that you go back and listen just to get the context for this episode. The first emperor's story begins with a merchant from Zhao who's named Lu Bu Wei. In the kingdom of Zhao, Lu Bu Wei meets a very interesting hostage in court, and that hostage is Prince Zichu. Prince Zichu happens to be the son of a junior low-ranking concubine of the current king of Qin. Prince Zichu is one of the 20 sons of the king of Qin, and there is no official succession status. So he's never expected to hold power, and as a result, he's living this fast and loose lifestyle in the kingdom of Zhao. Now, in a very interesting state of affairs, the current queen of Qin is officially barren, which is a horrible phrase to say, but effectively it means you can't produce children. Now, as a result of this, there is no official plan for succession. So Lu Bu Wei decides that there's some kind of political currency involved in Prince Zichu, and he proposes in one of these kind of shady backroom deals that he and Prince Zichu find a way to place the prince on the throne of the Qin. And as a result, they'll both advance their careers significantly. So Lu Bu Wei floats a bit of money. He gives it to Prince Zichu, who is going to purchase some gifts, and he's going to strike up a very friendly relationship with the then Queen of Qin. And the intention of this is he's going to propose that I should be your adopted son, considering you have no direct official heirs. So they approach the Queen with this proposal we should have a friendly relationship. The only reason that the queen is in any position of power, they remind her, is that the king is alive and that her status is assured because the king is madly in love with her. But whatever power-hungry individual succeeds the king is not going to show an ounce of that respect or clemency and might even have her executed and her extended family perched. So Prince Zichu suggests that were he a part of a clean line of a succession, the queen's future could be secured by a friendly new king. The queen, convinced that this is a great idea, convinces the king of Qin that Prince Zichu is a good fit, and they both agree that they will adopt him as the only and official son. So suddenly out of nowhere, Prince Zichu suddenly bypasses all of his siblings, all of his brothers, and he is the official heir. With Prince Zichu, the only heir, and Lu Bu Wei will become his official, in air quotes, tutor, they both just rapidly advance their careers and are in a much better place. Now after this, Lu Bu Wei has a concubine who is pregnant by him. Prince Zichu becomes infatuated with this concubine and demands that he, Lu Bu Wei that is, hand over the concubine and she'll become his woman. Now, Lu Bu Wei has hitched all of his position and his future to Prince Zichu, so he can't really upset him now. And I just want to make a very quick note or side note about this. But virtually all of this is probably slander by our grand historian to try and tell this outlandish story to both discredit the first emperor, the lineage of the previous dynasty, and kind of just throw a spanner in the works of showing these shady, awful backroom deals and this horrible, bloated, ridiculous, you know, Game of Thrones-esque history to, you know, to make them look really unsuitable and to not have the mandate of heaven. I didn't want to say Game of Thrones, but seriously, this is absurd. I'm amazed no one's dramatized this in the English language, as far as I'm aware, because this <laughs> I'm gripped. I know I'm not saying much, but this is just Yeah, it's a very, it's a very good point. Yeah, it is It is quite ridiculous. It, it has all of the flavor of a Greek tragedy on top of it. Um, so all of this could be totally a smear campaign. But anyway, with all of that aside, this crazy concubine, now the, the, the prince is now, you know, his, his new lady is now pregnant with someone else's child, put all that aside. After a few very suspicious royal deaths, Prince Zichu becomes the king of Qin. Now, after only being four years on the throne, the new king, uh, previously known as... I, I, I won't give him his official names. I don't want to throw in any kind of confusion. We're just going to keep referring to him poorly with our pronunciations as uh, King Zichu. So he dies in 247 BC. And he's 12-year-old son, and I'm putting son in air quotes here, because this is from the concubine that he had took from Lu Bu Wei, he takes over as the brand new king. And this king is Prince Zheng. And he will become the first emperor of China. A lot has happened there. And it's just given you a little bit of a very shady, awkward, political, you know, 
not trustworthy, very slanderous upbringing of the first emperor of China. But that is the official or the official recorded story of what has happened. That is absurdly unlikely. You're you're two layers of Ill- illegitimacy deep at this point. <laughs> like, <it's>... Yes. <laughs> yeah. It is. It's quite ridiculous just to put it even in that level of like, oh, okay, I suppose the double layer makes a big difference. So from our last episode, you might remember Lord Chang. And in a post-Lord Chang political world, other philosophical thinkers decide that they should also offer their services to various kingdoms, considering the success of Lord Chang's intellectual career, albeit that his career ended with him being pulled apart by chariots and cut it to at the waist, but his policies were implemented. So that's the important part. Other philosophical thinkers are now offering all of their services to various kingdoms, and a great philosopher by the name of Han Fei appears on the scene. Now, he is from Han, the kingdom of Han. Now, you'll notice very often in the naming convention, someone's surname will literally be where they were from, in the sense of you'll, you see a lot of ways, a lot of cheese, a lot of chins, a lot of hands, a lot of zhaos. So, so Han Fei, effectively from the kingdom of Han, he is our philosophical individual. He appears on the scene. And this was at a time when the kingdom of Han had been strong armed into a political alignment by the Qin. Now, Han Fei began as a student of Confucianism. But in the way that sometimes students, you know, go against their, their teachers or their parents or their thing, uh, he did a huge U-turn. And instead of going Confucian, he went very, very heavy into legalism. One thing to note about Han Fei was he had had a debilitating stutter. And he decided to overcome this by focusing on telling or directing his intellectual ideas through the medium of writing. So he didn't give any grand speeches. He didn't go to any, you know, beer halls and and give a, a nice dramatic telling of what he wants to do, rallying up the, the individuals. And, and he didn't have philosophical open debates with, with individuals on the street or, or intellectual kind of throwdowns. All of his ideas were pretty much committed to writing. So his writings, because of his legalist turn, would take legalism to their absolute extreme conclusions. So some examples of this were that the ruler of a state should be completely solitary and unreachable. They are above everybody else. Any other little queries are all pettinesses that the ruler should not have to deal with. Another example was that the ruler should take all praise for any successes of the state and place all blame on ministers and other officials when there's a failure. So in that way, the ruler is completely infallible. They can't make a mistake. Of course, they can't because they're brilliant. They're in charge. They're the head of the state. And he also defined, which was very important, who are the five vermin of the state. So coming in at number one were the intellectuals who praise past rulers. They got somebody giving out about how brilliant it was in the good old days. They're a problem to the state. The second was men other than the ruler of the state who gathered military support. So think about private armies, think about mercenary groups, bands of wandering warriors, that idea. These people, you know, militias. These are people who are armed to the teeth, have a lot of political opinions, and they could cause the state a lot of problems. The third vermin of the state were very simply draft dodgers. If you're going to have a state that's militaristic and, you know, based on agriculture and military, the last thing you want is people who just don't join the army. The fourth were speech makers and schemers. So these were similar to the intellectuals who praised past rulers, but these were individuals who, other than you, are rallying people, throwing out ideas, you know, shaking up the system, being something that's a problem to the state. And the last group of people were merchants or artisans who exploited the farming classes. So think of today where the idea of you might have, oh, this is a business and they hire a couple of hundred people and they work them to the bone. And, you know, they don't these people don't get to see their families and, uh, you know, anything like that. Any kind of situation where it's a really exploitative workplace where the people who work for them are not being exploited by the state, but exploited by private enterprise. That's also a problem. That really sounds like the only benevolent thing on the, that list. And really, you have to ex- imagine that it just comes from the fact that they don't want merchants gathering too much wealth for themselves and threatening their rule. It really... <laughs> I think all of these are still... Rel- if you're an aspiring dictator, I think these are all valid concerns that you should consider. Yeah, you should. You should be wary of like the... You're like, oh, I don't want to deal with these draft dodgers. I don't want these protesting students. I don't want these... Into- I don't want these private militias. It's It's funny. It's a lot of things that are really you know, tallied about greatness of uh, 
of, you know, free states of like, no, we have the right to protest. Yeah. They're like, no, you don't. <laughs> you shouldn't. And that's a problem. So we, we're looking at really totalitarian feudal-esque states going, all of these things are problems. Yeah. So Han Fei, our political writer, he would write the definitive book on legalism. And importantly, he would train a student. This student, even at the time, is acknowledged as not quite the equal of Han Fei. And this student is Lisa. Lisa would try his luck to advance by moving to Qin to better his status. Now, he's quoted as saying something along the lines when, roughly, you know, when roughly translated that the king of Qin wishes to swallow the world and now is a good time for an advancement for a commoner such as myself. So with all of that in mind, you have to understand that Lisa is all about trying to get himself into a position where his political ideology, like Lord Shang, he can go from the common status, influence policies, get all the way up to a nice lord status like Lord Chang and have a very comfortable life. Now, the king he was talking about was actually King Zichu, who had just died right before Lisa had committed his journey to Qin. So instead, he now offers his services to the boy king who has taken over, who will be the first emperor, King Zhang. There's a lot going on here. Remember this. Some of this could be slander as well. We've mentioned a few times that's the case. So this is where we're going to take on a very crazy little story that feels so unbelievably ridiculous. It's either all completely true or it's completely made up. I don't, I, I, would, I would love to imagine there's some kind of hybrid in the middle, but it's just so ridiculous. This is where it's, so keep, keep your hats on because this is about to go pretty crazy. So the Queen Mother and Lu Bu Wei restart their relationship once King Zichu has passed away. And then this queen, the queen mother, who was an ex-concubine, has a reputation for wanton behaviour, a wandering eye, and kind of a lustful nature. Now, once again, this will all be slander, but this is, this is where it's going to go. So Lu Bu Wei, fearing there's going to be a scandal with or from the queen mother and her various shenanigans, is going to try and resolve the situation in a very unusual way. So this is the insane story. Lu Bu Wei begins a secret search for a man with a gargantuan member. <laughs> and he succeeds in this little quest by finding, a, well, very large quest. Wei. But he succeeds in this quest by finding, finding a man, Lao Ai. And he employs Lao Ai as a house servant. And then, as the house servant, he implores that Lao Ai perform a very particular parlour trick of putting his member through the centre of a wooden wagon wheel and walking around the room unaided. So, <laughs> after achieving this feat, he ensures that news of this ridiculous, um, you know, parlour trick reaches the Queen Mother, and naturally, the Queen Mother is very intrigued to meet this individual. There's a problem, though. <laughs> so, okay, it's just going to get ridiculous, but there's a problem in this situation. Men are not allowed into the Queen Mother's section of the palace. So to get around this, Lao Ai is going to be accused of a crime and sentenced to castration. So they secretly stop the procedure once this faux trial has gone through and he's been, you know, accused of something ridiculous. And they pretend that this man has been castrated and to make him appear to be a eunuch, they have Lao Ai pluck out his hair so that he can now be employed as a servant of the Queen Mother in her part of the palace as a eunuch. From all of this, the Queen Mother starts up an affair with Lao Ai. And from this affair, unknown to everybody how she could just walk around not noticed, she gets pregnant twice and has two sons. Once again, it's such a ridiculous story with such ridiculous parts. It's hard to imagine where, where it's going to go. So... In 238 BC, reports of all these shenanigans reach King Zhang. So he finds out, ah, my mother's at it again. She's up to her old tricks and now she's hanging around with a guy who does parlor tricks. But it's rumoured that once the current king, King Zhang, is going to die, one of the two gigolo sons are going to replace him as king. And this is obviously a problem. We're going to have some kind of immediate horrible upset. So King Zhang orders an immediate investigation to this. However, and... It's such, a, once again, ridiculous story. You think that the the crown is currently in a dire strait situation here. There's a potential coup. He has to leave court to attend a religious festival, which is about 100 kilometers or 60 miles away. So he's not going to be around for this investigation. 
So Lao Ai, fearing the absolute worst, decides to steal the Queen Mother's imperial seal and he has letters delivered to incite revolts. So the news of the incited revolts reach King Zheng and he squashes them very quickly and then he, he does so by giving command to Lord Changping. As a response to this incited revolt, the king, King Zheng, places a one million coin bounty on Lao Ai, captured alive, and half of that if he's captured dead. Now Lai Ai flees, but is quickly captured alive for the full ransom and handed over. King Zheng, who's now about 22 years of age when all of this absolute cluster of a situation happens, he has just come of age, and he is donning the cap and sword and is officially now an adult. He has Lao Ai, the treacherous gigolo, killed by being tied to four chariots and pulled apart. He has his extended family purged, and he has the execution as well of the two half-brothers of, uh, you know, the two sons of Lao Ai and the Queen, which are effectively his two half-brothers. They are also executed. So he has a further 1,000 hangers on, dealt with, and 4,000 nobles that he suspect loyalty to Lao Ai completely expelled. So this is one of those purge moments of like, I want him dead, I want his family dead, I want his dog dead, I want his house burned down, I want yeah. everyone who has ever had contact, I want anyone who sold him a cup of coffee killed. So <laughs> For someone who is just kind of basically hanging around the palace and having an affair, 4,000 nobles being loyal to him sounds a bit... That sounds like he was looking an excuse to get rid of those nobles and this was the opportunity. So meanwhile, to continue this story, the Queen Mother, a.k.a. King Zheng's mother, is expelled to the city of Yang, which is about 100 kilometers or 60 miles away. And after a few years, he has a little bit of, um, you know, he laments kind of his decision and decides that she should be brought back. And 10 years later, she's going to pass away. Meanwhile, Lu Bu Wei is exiled 350 kilometers or about 220 miles away. And however, this is deemed not far enough, and he's exiled even further away to the area of Shu in the cold north. And as a response, knowing where this is going to go, the whole like, uh, you're going to send me further and further and further away, this is not going to go down very well, Lu Bu Wei commits suicide. So King Zhang, now aged 24, comes across the legal writings of a great scholar. Now, these writings include the five vermin of the state, which we mentioned. Now, Zheng is woefully impressed by these ideas, and he doesn't know that these are the writings of Han Fei. Now, um, Lisa, who is the advisor for Zheng, who, remember, came into the court, decided, this is how I'm going to advance my career, knows that these are the writings of Han Fei. But he does not let King Zheng know who this mystery writer is, because if he quite simply goes, yes, I do know who this person is, and they're way more qualified than me, much better individual, my intellectual superior, and you probably should hire him for a job. That's not going to go down too well. So instead then, he keeps it quiet and just makes sure that I don't tell the king here who this is. In 234 BC, the Qin invade the Han. Now, although the Han are like the junior partner in a kind of, a, in kind of a, an alliance with the Qin, the Qin eventually decide, all right, enough is enough. It's actually time to absorb you. In response to this invasion, the Han decide to send Han Fei. And he is going to, with the intention really, of negotiating with uh, King Zheng. Lisa, fearing that King Zheng would discover that this guy that they're going to send, this person to negotiate the, the, negotiate the deal, sort it out, make sure that everything goes well, that the king might figure out, wait, this is the guy that I've been reading all these writings, and I think he's this wonderful anonymous mystery writer. I go, why shouldn't I hire him or get him to work or, you know, or have him in my court and get ready, Lisa, you're fired, get out of here. You know, so fearing that that was going to happen, Lisa decides that he will have Han Fei immediately imprisoned, not get to talk anywhere before the king and just have him locked away. Just a little thing to, to note because it's, it's going to get, it's going to get messy because uh, ultimately the Han might have been able to stop an invasion or maybe form some kind of better unification if that individual was still alive. Some shades of Nixon sabotaging the, you know, Vietnam peace deal so that he could be president and then he'd be the one to do it. <laughs> Silly things, but it worked, yeah. So now, with all of this aside, the Chin War Machine is now back up and running. It had that little stall, it had that effect. It was knocked out a little bit, but ultimately the policies of Lord Chang, the equipment, the army, the manpower, 
the everything is back up and running again and it's time for the Qin to successfully bulldoze their way across China and take control of the area. So in 234 BC, the Qin successfully take the area of Pingyang from the Zhao. Now in the following year, the Qin army are led by Huan Yi and he embarked from Shangdang and successfully attacked and defeated the Zhao army. Now, Huan Yi will show up a little bit. He's quite, a, quite an individual. In 233 BC, the Zhao called back the famous Lai Mu out of retirement and appointed him as the commander-in-chief of all of the Zhao forces. Now, this engagement is going to lead to the Battle of Fei. We had this in the previous episode where I can only imagine when I read this, some official is riding up on horseback, coming out to the middle of the countryside, <laughs> knocking on a door and just going, Lai Mu, it's time to come out of retirement. We need you for one last big, <laughs> you know, hurrah. And once again, the whole, I'm not the man I used to be, but maybe I've got one left in me. So this is going to be the one left in Lai Mu. So for the Battle of Fei, Lai Mu moves his forces from the northern border and meets up with the remaining Zhao army to try and stop the Qin army advancing any further. Lai Mu is incredibly aware that the Qin army are going to be in high morale from recent victories from getting back on the horse, so he orders that a doubling down on defensive fortifications. We remember Lai Mu as the fantastic defensive general who is phenomenal in defensive fortifications, so if you want to imagine, dub- get that large amount, double up on it. This is going to be the most defensive fortification of defensive fortifications you're going to see. Meanwhile, the Qin general, Huan Yi, is aware that his troops are tiring from earlier victories of that year, so a very swift strike to end the Zhao would be essential to capitalise on. He's not going to make the previous mistakes that even uh, Bai Qi had pointed out. We are on the momentum, we need to keep going. So he organises an attack on the area of Fei, to force a move from Lai Mu. So another commander for the Zhao, Zhao Kong, requests that Lai Mu relocate from this double-down fortified area and save instead the area of Fei from the Qin onslaught. But Lai Mu does not take this bait. Instead, Lai Mu focuses his primary attack on a relatively unprotected Qin camp. Huan Yi, completely alarmed at this change of events, returns to defend his camp. If he's lost the camp, he's lost his, you know, he's lost his supply chain. It's too important to lose. So he is caught on the return in an ambush that was organised by Lai Mu. And this ambush is another shocking upset for the Qin army, who were on really the up and up and had finally gotten the momentum back on them. Now, the Qin attempted another attack in uh, another Zhao area, uh, Fan Wu, but once again they're defeated by Lai Mu, and the Qin war machine had been temporarily stalled once more. Now, Lai Mu, though he had suffered many casualties from both engagements, he had a few reinforcements, he's retired his army to the Zhao capital of Handan. So, Cahal, what does the history machine think about this engagement of battles with Lai Mu trying to stop and really successfully stopping the Qin onslaught machine again. Yeah, I think these ones are kind of interesting because we mentioned Lai Mu in the last episode and he see, he just came across as like competent, very few casualties, kind of got the job done, nothing too crazy. This is where it really kind of breaks because I guess in the Battle of Fei, he goes on the offensive and he does win. Uh, he wins mm-hmm. against expectation. The history machine gave him only maybe about a 45% chance to win Battle of Fei, and it only gave him about a 25% chance to uh, win the Fan Yu engagement. Okay. Um, So these are where he kind of maybe shows a bit more strength, like winning, you know, against the odds, whereas the other battles mentioned last episode, it was a little bit less surprising. He was kind of on the favorite side. However, as you say, the casualties Mm -hmm. were not nearly as good as those other battles, uh, particularly the Battle of Fei, He dealt out massive casualties, about 77% more than expected, but took 56% more than expected as well himself. We saw previously, like, he he did seem more comfortable defensively, and although he picked out, obviously, a good place to attack, a place that was not well defended, and a place Mm. that was crucial enough that they kind of forced a commitment, he lost a lot of his own army in the process, and I guess it was, you know, certainly a tactical win, but maybe not a strategic one. Okay, that's very fair. 
Now, it's funny because we've celebrated this guy as a really good defensive commander. And it's funny when you have to, you know, you have to go against your own natural strengths. He has to go on the offensive and his offensive isn't as good. He's still one, but definitely sloppier than when he's on the defensive end. Yeah. But it's funny because I think, uh, you know, obviously this person is going to be a much better general than you or I. But he must have come to some conclusion where if I just play it defensive, which he normally does, that will stall off my Zhang Nu, or that will stall off a rival kingdom up in the north or south who are invading. And I can make it very painful for them to try and take this territory. And when they don't, we might do a small counterattack and they lick their wounds and we're fine for another 20, 30 years. And that really stalls them. But what he's trying to stall now is a bulldozer. Yeah. Logistically, everything's kind of flipped. He's now kind of Mm. on the other side of things where they're the underdogs. You know, it's 30 years later and the, the armies are very different now than the previous ones he would have faced. It's really unusual. It's funny to think that he had to he had to go on the offense. Um, there's no other way around it because if he just played a defensive, that's not going to work this time because he can, you know, it's the whole kind of, if he won nine defensive battles, but they, they get the one offensive one that burns through, they're going to take the kingdom of Zhao. Yeah. And this is an army with the resources to have a sustained siege. They're not just raiding. Yeah, they, they won't just be held back by something small. So to carry on from there, this is almost divine intervention here. In 229 BC, the Zhao are suffered a severe internal damage from an earthquake and a famine. So, you know, fair play to Lai Mu. Good job, but I'm afraid divine intervention has jumped in here. Like, nature has decided, you know, you you can't beat an earthquake. Uh, So taking advantage of this situation, the Qin invade again. But to his credit, Lai Mu immediately begins to build defensive fortifications and he forces a Qin stalemate. So I think if, if you put anybody else here, I think they would have just been, as I said, trampled over. That would have been it. But this guy is, is all, you know, we, we mentioned that before. He's all that in a bag of chips. This is, this is what he can do. The history machine agrees with you on this one as well. It, it, we've registered this as a draw, but it, it only gave him a 25% chance. So to even salvage a draw is very, very impressive. And um, the casualty numbers in this one are back with his more classic battles. It's much more conservative, much less bloody and sloppy. So... Enter in 229 BC, during this stalemate, the Qin decide to input their general, Wang Jian. Now this, and we've mentioned before, the Big Four, this is the last contender of our Big Four generals for the Warring State period. Our new general, Wang Zheng, has spies sent to the Zhao court to bribe a minister named Gao Kai, who will convince King Zhen of the Zhao to replace Lai Mu, with Zhao Kong and Yan Zhu on the basis that Lai Mu is planning a coup. Now, <laughs> to test the loyalty, the king orders Lai Mu to surrender command to Zhao Kong and Lai Mu, in a pure sense of absolute frustration and like logic and intelligence, outright refuses, saying at this most critical time, now is not the time to replace me with a relatively untested commander when the state is on the verge of collapse, should we lose? Now, the king of Zhao, going, you you failed the test, Lai Mu, has him imprisoned and executed. Now, this has happened a few times, and it's a pattern that is out there. But I have to say, in warring states China, and we'll we'll probably come across it in other regions, but the idea that, the, the, the idea that you can just throw a spy into a court, spread a rumor, have... The, the unbeatable general of whatever generation they're dealing with go like, you should probably give up power. No, that would be a silly thing to do. Ah, he's a traitor. Have him imprisoned. And just, it happens. Like, you can do so much more damage with a well-placed spy than you could ever do with, like, a well-placed army. It is phenomenal how well this strategy is used and how efficient it is. The idea that they go, we can't beat Lai Mu. He's a really defensive commander. He's giving us so much trouble. We should have beaten these guys two or three times already. Just have him. Just have him killed. How? Internally. Have him internally killed. Okay. <laughs> it's, it boggles the mind of how effective the strategy is. And you don't think it should. But from there, okay, so now we're at this point where Lai Mu is dead. <laughs> He's imprisoned and executed. The Qin forces learn Lai Mu has been replaced. And even better than just being replaced, he's dead. They can't throw him. He's, he's not coming out of retirement now. They immediately pounce on this opportunity and they attack and destroy the Zhao army. And in 229 BC, the Qin conquer the Zhao. And they are done. So, Cahal, do you want to go into 
the Chin's conquering of the Zhou from the history machine's perspective, what it thinks was happening. Yeah, so now we just see immediate kind of uh, flip back in the Chin's favor. Uh, it did have this as 50-50 because I suppose in terms of resources, they're both big kingdoms, you know, and yes. it, it took a while, but, you know, to kind of batter them down. But the Zhao did have a lot starting off and under Li Mu, they were able to hold their own. But um, in this one, yeah, 50%, you know, win over expectation. The Qin dealt out about 22% more casualties than expected. They took about 12% fewer than expected. So yeah. quite a clean win in a 50-50 battle, quite a decisive win for the Qin here and for Wang Zhan. Yeah, and I think it's worth saying as, as well as the elimination of Li Mu, we do also have Wang Zhan inserted in his first battle. And uh, we'll go through the overall stats for the generals later on, but him compared to Huan Yi, the history machine definitely thinks he's much stronger as well. So you have a serious depletion of the command of the Zhao at the same time as an improvement on the Qin side. Oh, wonderful. Also, just to note, Zhao Kong, who was meant to take over, was killed in this battle as well. So shortly after this battle, the Qin are going to capture the Zhao capital, they're going to capture the king of Zhao and the kingdom of Zhao. So all with a a well-placed spy, a well-relocated general, that silly little test of like, I'm going to test the loyalty of my men and make sure they work out oh, there's some spy intrigue. Like, that was a, a knife's edge decision based on the, for the king of Zhao to kind of go, by removing Lai Mu, you have guaranteed the end of your state and the end of you as a king. And once again, I, I find that just so... Now, eventually, it makes sense. You probably agree with me, Carl. The grinding would have happened. It probably would have taken longer. Eventually, yeah. it would have been borne down. But it's just that it could be done so quickly. And so effectively. Yeah, because we're I like we look through the, our history machine database. The first battle we have involving the Qin and the Han happened sixty years prior, and the first one involving the Zhao happened thirty years prior. And now we're just seeing a rapid in the span of five to ten years, just things collapsing for everyone but the Qin, basically. Yes, very much so. So meanwhile, as well, so we were just looking at two twenty nine BC, but just in two thirty BC the Qin general Nishi Teng attacks a weakened Han state, which kind of, you know, had that loose alliance with the Qin and just fully absorbs it. So now we have two kingdoms of the seven that have been fully absorbed into the Qin. So here, we're going to take a little bit of a step back and we're going to talk once again about the king of Qin, who will be the first emperor. We're going to talk a little bit about where is this going to go. Ultimately, the writing is on the wall. Seven kingdoms have lost two, and those two have been absorbed into one other kingdom. And unless something drastically changes, it is a near certainty that in the future, the Qin are going to absorb the remaining four other kingdoms. So Prince Dan of the kingdom of Yan is alarmed. Now he fears that he is next on the chopping block. However, Prince Dan has in his possession a very interesting hostage. And that hostage is a Qin general who defected named Fan Yuki. Now, Fan Yuki is under Prince Dan's protection as a, you know, defective hostage. Kind of picture kind of a Cold War, you know, the spies going from east to west, you know, and vice versa. And that, like, we got this person who's very important. We're keeping him, we're keeping him protected. Now, the Qin have a reward of 250 kilograms or about 500 pounds of gold for whoever brings them the head of this general. Doing a rough calculation with today's gold value, the award is approximately in the tens of millions of, you know, dollars, euro. It's one of those things that the award is, the reward is so big, it doesn't matter what the currency is. <laughs> so it's, you know, someone's being offered a very, very tidy sum of many, many tens of millions to bring this guy's head in. Another important individual in the next phase of this story is a very calm, cool-headed swordsman by the name of Zheng Qi. He also sees the writing on the wall and he is very aware that the Qin are soon going to absorb the rest of the kingdoms. So he proposes a radical idea among these three men. Fan Kui will offer himself up as a sacrifice. This is the man with the, the price of gold on his head. So long that Zheng Qi can take this head and present it along with a detailed map of enemy territories to King Zhong and in person, in a relatively private meeting, the skilled swordsman Zheng Qi will then proceed to assassinate King Zhong of 
Qin. Fan Kui agrees to this arrangement. So he's going to have himself, you know, he's going to die, have his head cut off and go, this is my part of the plan. You're going to have my head and use it as a gift for this go-ahead meeting. The meeting does get to go ahead. And Zheng Ke presents the head of the traitor general and the map to the king of Qin, King Zhong. Suddenly, Zheng Ke pulls out a poisoned dagger and attempts to kill King Zhong. Due to just the court situation, King Zhong has the only other sword in the room. So the king attempts very clumsily to get his sword out to try and stop the would-be assassin who is chasing him around the courtroom. So while this is happening, while one man with a poison dagger is chasing the king and the king is running around trying to get a sword out of a scabbard, onlookers are just standing back in the court observing the madness. So the king's doctor then hits Zheng Ke with a medical bag over the top of the head. And stops the attempted murder. That is looking out for his health, I guess. <laughs> it, it really, really is. We've already had so many massive twists and turns because of, you know, yeah. spies and assassins and so on that I suppose that doctor just had enough of it. It's like, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I'm done. <laughs> so, uh... So after being hit over the head with the medical doctor's bag, you know, remember, do no harm. <laughs> but uh, Zheng Ke then throws the poisoned knife, but he misses. So it's, this, it's like, oh, but he misses. And the other court members then, seeing that this man is unarmed without a knife, they pounce on Zheng Ke and they beat him to death. <laughs> now, I'm going to go back a tiny bit. All of this again could be, you know, nonsense that's written by our grand historian, but I wonder, it, it's wonderful nonsense, um, and I love it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's high quality, like, nonsense and intrigue. It, it, yes. it is too fun to ignore. You gotta include it. Oh, definitely. After that botched attempt, in 226 BC, King Zhong uses this failed assassination attempt as a causes belli to invade the kingdom of Yan. It's like, hey, they tried to kill me. What, what more cause do I need? Now, King Zhi of the Yan ordered Crown Prince Dan's execution, this was the third man in the plot, and sends his son's head to the Qin as an apology for this botched assassination attempt. The Qin accept the apology and then decide that we'll accept this apology and we won't attack you for three years. So your son's head buys you three years of time. Um, instead then, with this very awkward peace arrangement, the Qin turn their focus to the kingdom of Wei. The Qin then, under the command of Wang Ben, attack the Wei capital and they put it under siege. The Wei capital has many, many excellent natural defensive features. They include extensive drawbridges, well-built moats, you know, uh, towers, turrets, so it's incredibly, tremendously difficult to capture. So our general, Wang Ben, labours his troops for three months and in the process, he uses the Yellow River to flood the city, killing 100,000 people. The Wei surrender, and the kingdom is absorbed into the Qin. So, Cahill, what does the history machine think about the Qin's conquering and absorption of the kingdom of Wei? The history machine had this as, I guess, relatively standard. It was kind of, uh, it did expect the Qin to win. Um, I suppose they're better resourced army. It had the casualties as relatively low, which I suppose is the most surprising thing. They were fairly close to expectation, but I think sometimes the history machine, when it sees huge numbers like this, the expectation ends up just being that lots of people are going to die. Okay, that's, that's you know, that's very fair. Yeah, I suppose, well, you know, as I said, they flooded, like, the way that it ended probably made a big difference in the sense that they flooded it with a river and killed 100,000 people, but... The, you know, they're taking out a whole state and they're taking on a whole state. And I'd say with the flooding situation, it's like we have to offer our surrender. So I suppose it's probably a combination that the history machine is expecting the chin to be bloody and it's expecting a really bloody end. I think that's what it is in this case. Because, um, yeah, and it, it does give the chin about an 80% chance to win this battle beforehand. So it does have a lot of confidence in them. So, yeah, unusual that for such huge damaging battle that that the casualties dealt over expectation was only about 4% higher than it thought, but an interesting one. Okay, that makes a big difference. Right, so as you see, the Qin are just a, 
you know, this is the the steamrolling effect we were expecting from the last episode until they had a few upsets. And at the start of this episode, where they had another upset by Lai Liu, he's really uh, shortened their conquering. But they're just back on the horse and conquering again. And now we're seeing the natural progression of just absorbing kingdom, absorbing kingdom, absorbing kingdom. So the next on the Qin agenda is going to be the conquest and absorption of the Chu kingdom. When King Zheng, the Tubi emperor, asked how many troops was he going to need to take the kingdom of Chu, Wang Jian replied it was going to take 600,000 troops. Another general, Lai Xin, proposed that he could take the kingdom of Chu with only 200,000. Now King Zheng, kind of like a, you know, goes to the lowest, you know, the, the highest bidder or the lowest resources at the best time, that kind of a thing, he gives Lai Qin the requested troops to conquer the Chu. Now, initially, with this 200,000-man army, there are great successes from a few small battles. However, the Chu held back their troops with the intention of a massive counterattack once the Qin had extended into the kingdom. And they pulled together half a million troops to completely crush the Qin 200,000 and kill almost everybody, including some completely irreplaceable officers during an ambush. Now, Cahill, we'll go back to the history machine about this one, but you kind of think the Qin have had upsets before. What does the history machine think of this one? This is a very bad defeat according to the history machine. Okay. The battle itself, uh, it... It had the Chu as underdogs, but not massively. It, you know, it, it was only a little bit under 50%. It was maybe 48% chance of winning. But the casualties dealt to the Chin were 87% higher than expected, which is oh, wow. okay. enormous. <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's unheard of. Yeah, I think that's unheard of in, um, for the Chin. Yeah, today. that's far and away the highest that the Chin have had mm. in the database. Yeah. Now, it's mad because, you know, they do have the two, you know, it's 200,000 men, they, lo- they lose it, and it, it's a shocking defeat, and I suppose they have the resources to continue. But were this a smaller kingdom, they were done, but it's definitely an upset that they cannot afford to happen, you know, a few more times. But by all means, it, it should stall it. So naturally, after this crushing, crushing defeat, with loss of men, and importantly, you know, that goes, some men are more important than others, but they've lost, like, the institutional established officers here. So, like, the 200,000 that would have been sent to this kingdom are the cream of the crop. They would have been the best of the best, the finest of the finest, the most experienced veterans of the most experienced veterans, and they've lost them. So King Zheng, after hearing about this massive, crushing defeat, personally goes to meet Wang Zheng, who is in retirement. So back to this (laughs) trope again. Imagine the king is on a horse, riding up into the village. We're after seeing, you know, it, it's such a common trope. And we've, it's happened several times before, but this time it's not a messenger. It's a king on a horse and he's riding into town and he's knocking on the door and he's meeting the old retired general and he offers his apologies. And he says, hey, we need you for one last job. And I'd like to offer you 600,000 troops to conquer the Chu. Now, I'm going to put a note across here just for a couple of things. One, the king meeting him personally is obviously this big apology of like, we should have trusted you in the first place. But number two, we have seen the Qin have, you know, or supposedly reported have a lot of troops for very particular battles. But this is the first time where 600,000 troops are going to be given to the command of kind of an autonomous single commander. And that is an enormous sum of troops and manpower to give to any general. And this amount would single-handedly make Wang Jian the most dangerous person in China. And he would immediately be able to turn on King Zheng should he decide to and just take control of Qin. So to calm the king, Wang Zhen keeps constant contact throughout the campaign and he requests over time that King Zheng reward consistently and repeatedly Wang Zheng's family with gifts, bonuses, land, that kind of a thing, just to make sure that they're in a really good place financially and, you know, you know, fiscally, financially and, you know, noble-wise while the Chu conquest is going on and until it's complete. So thus giving some incentive for this army to be used just by the general to conquer these areas but not to be turned around and for a Sulla-like situation to happen. So all of this is going to lead into the 225 BC Battle of Pengyu. 
Wang Zhen's army camp is attacked by the Chu. And Wang Zhen orders to dig in and fortify the positions. The Chu army is going to try to entice the Qin out of the fortified areas, but Wang Zhen made sure that his troops are going to hold firm and they don't pursue the enemy because the last time they pursued the enemy, they lost the 200,000 troops. So once again, the Chu now begin an ordered retreat. Wang Zhen, seeing the ordered retreat, springs a vicious surprise counterattack, kills the Chu commander Zhang Yang, and routes the Chu army. It's kind of a lot of fainting going on. It's the whole, we're going to attack you, you're going to fortify your position, you're going to tell people not to get out of the fortified position. When we make the ordered retreat, you, you spring a surprise attack, and that surprise attack results in a victory. It's a little bit back and forth, a little bit of kind of punch, parry, 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 counterpunch. But it, there's there's a, a lot of small actions going on that ensure this victory. But Cahill, what does the history machine think of that sequence of events and think of Wang Zhen's 600,000 troops conquering the kingdom of Chu? So again, I think the history machine does see the Qin overall in, in this era. It's ranking them as the favorites to win. It did give them a 65% chance to win this battle. But again, although on the different side, it's the casualties dealt figure that stands out the most as the Jin and Wang Jian dealt out 52% more casualties than expected. Oh, wow. Okay. They themselves took about what was expected, um, maybe 1% fewer than expected, but the casualties dealt were enormous, according to the history machine. So this is really kind of a, a decisive blow now. Okay. Well, it is decisive because the Kingdom of Chu is done. The Jin follow up with a couple of smaller attacks... But, you know, it's over for the Kingdom of Chu. In 223 BC, they're fully absorbed. Just to note, for our big four commanders, in 214 BC, Wang Zhen dies peacefully of old age. At the time of death, he is 90 years of age. So, of the big four here, he's probably, I think he's the only one who actually gets that, you know, nice, quiet, peacefully into the night kind of death. In 222 BC, the Qin turn and follow up with the conquest of the kingdom of Yan. So they go, listen, your three years are up. What have you been doing? We've been at war. <laughs> so they, they, the peace is over and they're going to attack the kingdom of Yan and fully absorb it. Now, once again, Carl, I think it's probably just the same actions here, but the history machine must just think that this is kind of it, you know, the it, to be expected. The Qin are just going to absorb them. Is Would I be accurate in saying so? At this point, the history machine... Yeah, it just knows that the Jin yeah. are going to win. I think it has one of the highest kind of the it's it's one of the lowest expected like wins over expectation because it was just so sure that the Jin were going to win this. It gave them about a ninety three percent chance to win this battle, and the casualties are more or less exact. the The, the Jin take maybe seven percent fewer casualties than expected. The Yan take exactly how much they're expected to take. Like it, it just had it where. It, the Qin were going to win this. Well, so with that in mind, the, the Qin, they've fully just absorbed the kingdom of Yan. And in 221 BC, the only kingdom that's left is the kingdom of Qi. And they're the only holdout. They don't have the manpower. They don't have the resources. They don't have the equipment. They don't have, they don't really have the finance. They don't have anything to, to hold out against. It's six against one here now. The, the resources of six absorbed kingdoms against one, the game's over. It's like it's like the late game of Monopoly where some well, there's one player left who's a holdout who owns one street and the other player owns everything. It's, it's over. It's just a matter of rolling the dice a few more times and that's it. The kingdom of Qi, they're the only ones that, that are left. Funnily enough, this goes back to one of our stratagems, but for years, the Qin had interfered with Qi politics they had introduced bribes, they had introduced spies, they had other agents in courts, and they had made flimsy alliances with the Qi with the intent to ensure that the Qi provided no support to any of the other states during conquests. So this is the idea of, you know, befriend someone distant, conquer someone nearby, and eventually it's like, well, now you are now our neighbour. You are now the person we have to conquer. We no longer need to have a flimsy arrangement with you. That's that. So in 221 BC, Lai Jin moves a very large army quickly into the heart of Qi land. He avoids confrontation. He finds a little bit of resistance along the way, but ultimately not much, and marches straight up to the kingdom of Qi's capital. He then meets the, the king of Qi, Chan Zhan, and that king surrenders without resistance, and the Qi becomes officially part of the new Qin Empire. So, 
This is the very, very end of the whole situation. We now have the seven kingdoms are now one. They're united under one banner. And we're going to have somebody who's going to be the new ruler of all of this area. So I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent just for a moment to explain a little bit about the emperor and where his title comes from before we finish up this episode. So the last time China had some kind of homogeny, we had the Zhao in charge and they had a king. And that king had various dukes and eventually when they lost the mandate of heaven, you know, those dukes formed independent states and they were dukes for a long time. And then over the process, each of the dukes promoted themselves to the position of king. So that's why when we were mentioning earlier episodes, sometimes we'd say it was the Duke of Qin or the Duke of Wei or, you know, the, the titles changed over time. The, the gravitas of the position, it changed. That suddenly this kingdom or state was doing better and then the state would become officially a kingdom and now we're, you know, declaring complete independence that that's what we're doing so because of that because everyone and his mother was declaring himself as a king suddenly the title of king just wasn't enough for king Zhong of Qin. he kind of goes it doesn't really signify the grandiose of my achievement he is going to appoint himself with a brand new title he is going to look to history to come up to an idea of what should i name myself And historically, there was the legend of the Yellow Emperor. Now, the title was effectively D. Uh, So it's D means emperor, and it comes from like the Yellow Emperor's lineage. So that's going to be borrowed as some semblance of a title. But he needs something a little bit different. He needs that little extra bit of pizzazz. So he's going to combine it all together and be known as Qin Shi Hong Di. And Qin is the area, Qin. Shi means the first. Hong is a Chinese equivalent of the word august, and Di is emperor. So it says something to the along the lines of Qin's first august emperor. And that is now the brand new title for the first emperor of China. Now, there is a lot to be said about throwing in that little part of first august emperor, as opposed to just the emperor. That would imply that the Qin were here to stay. And of course, why wouldn't they? All those resources behind them, they control everything. This is totally going to last for centuries. To come. <laughs> oh, it's going to last for a very long time. <laughs> a very, very, very long time. <laughs> They've displayed all the hubris of Pokemon, the first movie. Yes, very much so. <laughs> so uh, that's going to give you spoilers for the next episode. It's not going to last too long after all of this conquering is going to bleed into it. So we're going to end this episode, but we are going to come back with finally the rise and fall of the Qin Empire and what was involved in the aftermath of it and the death of the first emperor of China. So for this episode, Cahal, we're going to round it up. We're going to close it up. We're going to look at a top five generals. And coming in then, please, at number five. So number five. And this episode, there's a, a lot of battles. We kind of rushed through them, but there are so many battles. There's a lot going on. Nearly half the generals we'll have across all China episodes are in this one. So wide spectrum of abilities here. We start with Li Jin of the Jin. He had three battles, two wins, and his wins over expectation was minus point. One three. Oh god. And you have to think, you know, that's surprising for someone who won most of their battles, but the one he lost was the Chin defeat to the Chu, where they lost eighty percent eighty seven percent more than expected according to the history machine. And then the two battles where he won, he was kind of the secondary commander. He was behind Wang Ben or he was uh he was playing second fiddle effectively to whoever was yeah. Essentially, yeah. yeah. When when he when he took the lead it went disastrously wrong so his stats go down like even though his, the stats were very re- good in the other two battles that one loss drags him down very badly um the casualties sustained above expectation are 24 percent higher than you'd th- think and most of that is just from that one battle no i find that kind of fascinating because it, it i think this is a great example because he did have the the big upset in the story it was like how many men do we need to conquer this territory and he underestimated it even though he would have been a military man with the experience and the knowledge giving him a a slightly below average commander score is probably accurate in that situation mm. where he was put in charge of an army that was well-equipped, well-drilled, well-financed and had a lovely victory record behind it and managed a significant devastating loss with it. And that would probably imply that he was maybe coasting as a junior commander for quite a bit of time and when eventually took over, you know, didn't have 
that je ne sais quoi special secret sauce that maybe made the chin officers a little bit better than other areas around them. So it, it, I, I think it's a great example of a commander that gets a slightly negative score just to kind of go, yeah, if you put him, imagine if you put him in charge of another kingdom that had, you know, less resources, less troops, less, you know, less drilled soldiers, he probably would have performed much worse. He wouldn't exactly be able to bring, a, you know, it, it, it's, it's like the example of a good coach or a good, you know, teacher is able to, you know, take a bad student or a, or a bad practitioner and get them to a better place. I think he's somebody who had already had, a, you know, if we're using a boxing analogy here, he had a great fighter and he was just the coach in the corner who kind of went, just do what you normally do. Yeah. And then it didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So coming in at number four. At number four, we have Huan Yi, who has a massive eight battles. Okay. Uh, five wins and a draw. Uh, his wins over expectation is minus... Point zero five. So he is basically average. He is okay. almost precisely to expectation. His casualty sustained numbers is eight percent higher than expected. Casualties dealt five percent over expectation. All really, really close to expectation. You would think with the winning record he'd be a bit higher up, but I think three of his wins, History Machine had them with eighty percent or more chance to win. So it was really he really was just. He was a general with a better army than the enemy, yeah. and so he did better. It was, again, not really... He didn't have any big catastrophes in the same way. He had some losses, but they weren't the same kind of, this is taking the army out for a few years kind of losses. But, you know, he was he was fine. He didn't really seem to do much positive, but he didn't... Uh, he wasn't reckless either. Yeah. All right, so it kind of shows that he's, he's average or bog standard, and he's a person... He's a reasonable commander with, with a very, very good ar- army. So it makes sense that, you know, with a war machine that big and that bloated and that developed and with that much resources, you're going to get people who are kind of, okay, they do the job they're meant to do, but they're no super standouts. So coming in then, please, at number three. Number three, we have Zhao Kong for the Zhao. And I think this is interesting. And this shows as well how the history machine, it favors underdog. You know, it, it doesn't like people who are favorites. It doesn't like people who expect to win because he had four battles and only won one of them. But because he was pretty much always, at this stage, the Zhao were well in decline, he was always the underdog. That one win was able to put him up to an average score. It's very close to Huan Yi, really. Like, it's, it's point, you know, he's yeah. minus 0. 0.04, you know, wins over expectation. He's very close to average in casualties sustained and casualties dealt, everything else. But um, his, his, casu- his commander casualties sustained is worse than average because he died in the last battle. But, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, which isn't great self-preservation. But, um, yeah, he, he comes out very average because History Machine just feels that he was expected to lose all the battles that he did lose. Yes. Um, so that one win was enough to kind of put his score up to something respectable. Hey, yeah, that's very, very fair. It's funny. I think he, it, and not to say too little too late, but he learned a lot too late in terms of it seems that his ability went up after the losses and eventually he gets one small micro win uh, during the conquest but you're like okay you may have become a better general and have been you know the steel hardening steel situation yeah. but now it's too late and and one thing to note as well the one battle he did win that was co-commanding with uh Lemieux so <laughs> that he, Lemieux may have raised a score a bit for him as well yeah 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 that's very fair <laughs> so it's funny it, it does as you said it br- brings up his it bring up his score a little bit and puts him a teeny bit above average so I suppose you know may, maybe three is probably a good place to put him for this episode in terms of you know he's definitely the underdog and has to try and pull something out of the bag and didn't wasn't able to do it which is why he's not number one but uh doing pretty well so then coming in please at number two number two then is wang jian okay and he has five battles four wins one draw yes uh win over expectation of 0.205 so like solidly above average he's not like legendary status but he's certainly in the good very good kind of tier yes, of general yes. casualties sustained is maybe about six percent lower than expected casualties dealt about 12 percent higher so mm-hmm. no crazy crazy numbers but um very just very very solid and i think as well as we've mentioned the chin were the favorites for this period in almost all their battles so to have a good score is actually kind of standing out it, it just shows you know it, it shows a good bit of strength because you exceeded expectation, and the expectation was already quite high. Yes. So it, this is probably the, the first example we have of, of the good coach with the good fighter. You know, it's like yeah. you were able to 
you were able to get a bit more out of him in that sense, or a bit more out of the army with your with your particular, you know, generalship. Now, this is one of the big four, so it's a good sign that, you know, he's coming out pretty well. And, you know, with the war machine behind him, he's definitely showing that he's he's a capable driver of the war machine that he's about to plough into the other kingdoms and take over. So it's a good sign that this guy, well, this guy is responsible for establishing, you know, the Qin Empire. That it it we did have our previous earlier commanders are undefeated by Qi, you know, and our other earlier Qin commanders who were able to have stunning victories but didn't finish it. So think that like Bai Qi, our earlier Hannibal esque Chinese commander, was not able to, you know, unify and create the Qin juggernaut that is finally established. Now you could probably make an argument that this was going to happen. It was inevitable, you know, with the resources and the equipment and the army and the the state funding that this was going to be a thing. But this is the guy who forms the kingdom. He forms the, well, not even the kingdom. This is the guy who forms the empire. So he's got to rank very high. You know, you have to have some semblance of quality in your commanders if you're going to do that. And this man is that quality. So finally, I don't think there's going to be a big surprise. But Cahill, who's coming in as number one? So number one here is Lee Mew. Yay! Who, uh, I, th- I think got mentioned the last episode as well because he had a long career. He certainly did. Five battles, 4.5 wins 0.35 wins over expectation 17 uh, percent more casualties dealt out than expected mm. his he's actually one that I, I think it's interesting to compare to wang jian because whatever about their overall like you know wins over expectation i'd say they would have a very high similarity score in their stats they're both ones that were very patient defensive wouldn't go on the offensive until things were right for them. Yeah. Um, and so, and you kind of see that reflected where their casualty numbers are quite similar. And even their, you know, they they had one draw and then won all the rest of their battles. Um, like, it, it's very, very similar stats between two of them. And really, really, I think the key difference why Lee Mew gets rated higher by the History Machine is that the latter half of his career, he was the underdog. Mm. Whereas Wang Jian kind of had his whole career being the favorite. Whereas yes. Lee Mew only really had that for the first half. That's very true. And then again, he didn't like he probably, you know, with enough assaults by the by the Chin army, he probably would have been defeated. But that clever use of just placing the spy in the court, planting the seed of doubt, having the king turn on literally his best commander who pretty much grabbed him in response and was like, you need to understand I am the only thing holding your kingdom together. <laughs> and you're like, yes. And you should probably go to jail then. <laughs> but, but to convince that somebody who is clearly brilliant that, nah, we should just lock him up and have him executed. And then the, the counter being that the chin pounce, capitalize, absorb, and then repeat the process, pounce, capitalize, absorb, pounce, capitalize, absorb for every other remaining kingdom. He was the, the defensive dam that was holding back the flood. And when he's gone, it just led to that spilling out of the chin. Yeah. And they could conquer and absorb everything they needed to unify that region of China and make it the first proper dynasty. Yeah, we don't we don't have a database, obviously, for like the best spies because a famous spy is not a good spy. That's a good point. <laughs> but we really see here, I think we're really seeing in the China episodes versus a lot of the, you know, Western European ones and things like that, so much more of the influence from, you know, intrigue and politics. And I don't know if it necessarily happens more or if it just gets... I, I feel like Western history tends to prioritize stupid slash courageous charges and everything yes. being, you know, up front, in your face, attack, attack, attack. Whereas the Chinese one tends to lean a lot more nuanced. It tends to favor telling stories about who was the most shrewd or who was yes. patient and picked their moment a lot more. Whether it, that's the actual history or that's just how it's told, I suppose, is, you know, always up for debate. But yeah. that does seem to be how things are coming through in the history machine anyway, where we're maybe we're maybe not seeing as spectacular scores in terms of wins over expectations from a lot of the Chinese generals, but the stories behind them tend to be incredible. Yes, uh, it, I think one of the big findings of these episodes are the convoluted method of the battle it's not just a straightforward i line my army up you line yours they smashed at each other and won won and won lost and that was it there's a lot of like fainting pretending deceiving lying intrigue messing with people's supply you know there's a there's an awful lot of shenanigans and messing and that (laughs) all adds up then for one phenomenal spectacular win and the usage of the spies i i know we've gone on a little bit about it but um it's ridiculous. I, I, I'm, I'm imagining hypotheticals where I'm like, 
what if you could transport a couple of these spies halfway across the world to like you know the the first and second Punic War and somebody goes oh it's the Battle of Zama uh, Scipio we've decided to replace you today with an untested completely new individual and you go why why would you do that well we think you might be getting a little bit too you know dangerous for Rome so for a battle this important we should probably put an untested person in there he's like this feels ridiculous well if it feels ridiculous you're probably going to go to jail now <laughs> And then suddenly uh, getting a retired Hannibal. <laughs> you know, it, it's it's this wonderful story of just pulling the most competent people out of positions and and then alternatively pulling the most competent people back into a position right when they're both critically needed. Yeah. <laughs> and it makes the biggest difference. And I have to I have to say of all of the findings we have of these of uh, these battles and these episodes and these figures that has to be one of the biggest takeaway that the value of a spy in this period in Chinese history seems priceless. And I have to, you know, I, we've harped on a little bit about it, but... Mm. Unless they get hit by the, your doctor's medical bag, of course. <laughs> yes, of course, yeah. The failed assassination attempt with a medical bag works pretty well. Uh, <laughs> or the, the saving of a life. I, he must have been appointed chief surgeon for that one. It makes a big difference. So, a fun episode. We will be back again for one more episode on this period in Chinese history and it will be on the Qin Empire as a whole. So, thank you very, very much for listening. If you want to contact us, we have a Twitter page. You can reach us at historymachinepodcast at gmail.com or our website, historymachinepodcast.com. So, we'll be back again soon. So, thank you very, very much uh, for listening. I'm Niall. And I'm Cahill. Thanks. And we'll see you again next time.